uh, processes. Um, and I and actually I started uh, I hadn't participated in the process. And last year then, okay, four people from Ecuador participated. And, and of course, there were also Global South representatives last year. But also there was a, the, the region had a limited participation. So I will be addressing some of these challenges when it comes to, you know, um, be able be more active and participate in IPCC processes. I think basically this happens because we don't know what the process is like. You know, this is a case of many researchers uh, and also the call is made through managers of the environment. And then, you know, there is a whole previous process where you need to send your CV, you know, uh, talk about your ex area of expertise. And then the ministry approves your application and then it is sent to the IPCC offices. So I think, you know, that part of the process should be better known and researchers should pay attention to this as well, because right now we are in the AR7 process. And I think this is clearly an opportunity, you know, is an opportunity uh, for many of us especially for those who are mid-career, you know, so that you can expand, um, broaden your networks, improve your areas of expertise, and you can work with regional perspectives, micro policies, and also talk about climate justice and the need to, you know, uh, really address what's happening in our region so that we can hear the voice of, our region, especially in the funding negotiation process. Uh, and I think this should, our region should participate uh, so that our vulnerable population can be helped as well. Also, the material. Well, when you start working at the IPCC and you try to, you know, analyze all the information, all the messages, well, that's a new challenge. Sometimes, the information from our regions, you know, in order to conduct the the assessment necessary to analyze a, a policy on adaptation, mitigation, or in joint adaptation and mitigation processes, we find uh, limited material. I did find um, a great literature indeed. This means that, you know, uh, the entire region, you know, South America in particular, we should start promoting these national and uh, sub-regional studies. For instance, the Andes area, the Southern area, so that we can conduct a comparative analysis with the information we already have from official documents such as uh, national, uh, uh, det national determined contributions, other mitigation processes conducted in other countries, etc. We can do this in order to promote our vision, our results. And it, it's very difficult to find policies that are already implemented and much less uh, assessed. So that's essential. Um, also, I think there's another major challenge, and this is the publications that we need in the region. And this means that we need to, you know, um, analyze our inner situation. Universities do make an investment, researchers as well. Sometimes researchers themselves um, need to, you know, read as a, as a, or need to publish in specialized journals. And this, they might have to invest between $3,000 and $9,000, you know, for a um an acknowledged journal and that might entail a limitation to many of our universities and research centers therefore this is also uh, an expression of inequality and we need to see how the ipcc processes should try and reduce this inequality 
let's think about countries like uh, uh, African countries where they really have limited funds to pay for this kind of fee. Therefore, we need to strengthen our work so that open access can really reach other countries, but we need to support the process. Also, uh, and during the pandemic, the technology we had before to access events, uh, before we had many in-person events, but after, during the pandemic, we, we had to use the technology. And many times, um, it, it's not easy to have a good internet connection in our region, you know, um, with, a with a good speed and all that. So it's very likely that many researchers from our region could not have access to the, these meetings, meetings as they should have. So if we want better participation in IPCC processes, more equity, more work from the region, we need to consider all this as well, because we need specific funds so that researchers have, have better internet access. For instance, uh, some of these meetings were in person before, and many of them are, are virtual now. And I think in the future we'll have, you know, a hybrid uh, system. We need to see how we can press, um, support the, uh, these uh, connectivity issues. And finally, and based on my experience, I would also like to uh, uh, make universities and research centers aware of these activities. This implies a lot of work, not just coordinating work. It's a lot of time that should be, you know, acknowledged in the academic load. Um, also, when it comes to the, you know, the results, yeah, I don't know, you, you participated in, uh, as a PI in one of the groups and the work takes four years, for instance, and usually this is not taken into account when researchers are assessed. So we need to try and find another way so that they find this work relevant, but uh, the deliverables are there. So we need to see how we can help researchers because researchers spend uh, and invest a long time when they need to review the literature, uh, when they review other documents, when they organize things, when they contact other researchers, you know, to have an idea of what's going on in order to uh, do their job. There's also something else that is very important. As researchers, when we start, uh, you know, contacting our ministries of the environment, uh, we need to pay attention to these processes in order to have uh, a clear conversation, you know, so that we can work with government, so that we can help them uh, achieve their goals, for instance, within the framework convention, and they also should should into consideration the work uh, the work done by researchers because they need to systematize what's going on. Also, they work on policy. They work on what science does. I think this that's also a major contribution that should uh, help uh, national and local governments. So that's something else we need to implement. But once again, we need support. We need support so that researchers can start, you know, crossing the, that line, working from science, but we need articulation with the national and regional policies. And also we need to, you know, detect the good practices, especially those that will guide us in our region so that we can address climate uh, change issues, reduce inequality and be more resilient in our struggle. So that's what I wanted to say, uh, generally speaking. Here we have two uh, excellent panelists, two young researchers, one from the north and another one from the south in Colombia. Now I would like to introduce them so that you can, uh, you know, get to know them and also try to make the most of their perspective and reach some conclusions after listening to them. So first of all, let's have Sherry Lee, Sherry Lee Harper. Is that right, Ines? Sherry Lee next. 
Tisi, presenta a Sherry Lee primero. Yes, go ahead, Sherry Lee first. Ok. Ok, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Sherry Lee Harper. Sherry Lee is a professor at the uh, Canada Research Chair in Climate Change and Health, and she's an associate professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. Her research uh, investigates associations between weather, environment, and public health in the context of climate change. Also, she collaborates with partners across sectors to prioritize climate-related health actions, uh, planning, interventions, and research. She is a lead author on two intergovernmental panel on climate change reports. And also, she has served on the gender task group for the IPCC. Sherry Lee, you have the floor. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen because I have a couple of slides. Um, does that look okay? Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and assume it looks okay. It's, it's so great to be here today. Um, thank yes, you so okay. much um, for the, oh, perfect. Um, it's so great to be here today and it's great to be able to um, talk about some of my own experiences with the IPCC and, and especially my experiences with the IPCC as um, a female um, lead author in, in working group two um, on the, the recent report on impacts and adaptation that was just published in February. And I was also an author on the special report on oceans and, and cryosphere that was um, released a couple of years ago. So um, I, I wanted to focus uh, my remarks on, on being um, a woman um, and, and what it was like to be a female, a female author. Um, so I think that a, a lot of us are, are all too familiar um, with some of the challenges that still persist for women in science. Um, everything ranging from lower wages to um, limited funding and, and training opportunities, um, fewer women being promoted to leadership positions, um, fewer citations in the literature, uh, not very many role models um, that we can look up to. So women who are in, in senior positions, at least not compared to men, um, more experiences with harassment, um, greater family responsibilities. And about a decade ago, there was um, a survey that was done and about 70% of men and, and women who participated in the survey viewed science as a male pursuit. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we see some of these things manifest in the climate change science world as well. So, for example, in 2021, you might have heard about the, the Reuters ranking of the world 1000 leading climate scientists, um, which was based on different um, uh, journal publication metrics, and only two women made it to the top 50 scientists. And of the entire list of 1000 people, um, there just 12% um, were women. Um, but at the same time, we know that including women in research teams enhances innovation, it enhances discovery, and in the context of the IPCC report, um, it, it increases the, the quality of the final product of the reports that are being produced, um, and it's also really important in terms of the process as well. Um, so. Uh, you know, you might ask the question, how do these experiences of women in science and women in climate change science, how do they extend to the actual IPCC process itself um, and, and being involved? Um, and well, actually, it's, it's interesting because there has been research that has, has looked at this. Um, so research that was done by Dr. Liverman and, and her colleagues, they did a survey of IPCC authors to dig into some of these, these questions. Um, there's some good news, I think, that came out of the study, and the first is that, you know, we see increasing number of authors who identify as, as women um, on the reports. So as of 2021, um, about a third of the authorship were identified as female. Um, interestingly, this, this varies, so that's what this bottom panel here shows. Um, so in working group one, which is the physical basis, um, it has the, few, uh, the lowest percentage of, of female authors. Um, working group two has the most, um, and working group three is is um, is slightly behind there. So there are differences between work, working groups. 
Um, and you know, just because women are included as, as authors on the report, it doesn't mean that women have equal voice or have power in, in those situations. So this, this study also um, looked into that. They asked, they asked authors what their experiences were. Um, and some of the results were, um, were good, I think. Um, so for example, here, this uh, asked the question whether or not women um, were respected in the process. So this includes the lead author meetings. It includes the meetings in between the lead author meetings, the writing in the process, responding to reviewer comments, all of those, um, those pieces and part of the process of the IPCC assessment reports. Um, so here you can see that, um, you know, 90% of men thought that women were respected in the process and over 80% of women um, felt that way too. So you can see that most survey respondents felt that women were respected in the process, which is good. But you can see that there's a difference in how men and women perceive that. Um, so men perceived that, that women were um, more respected more often than, than women felt that way. And you can sort of see similar trends on these next questions that were asked um, about having equal opportunities to participate, equal opportunities to speak in the process, um, and also this interesting question about um, men dominating the discussion. Um, so in that bottom panel on men dominating the discussion, you can see that um, uh, there was quite a perception that men did dominate the, the, the discussion, and men acknowledged this too. Um, so men even recognized that that was tending to happen. Um, and, and again, in these two other categories, you can see that uh, men more often felt that uh, we were, you know, doing better in terms of equal opportunities to speak com compared to how women um, perceived this. Um, so, you know, a couple of other things that were, were really interesting um, that aren't shown on the screen, but I wanted to mention is that these trends in, in terms of the differences between how men and women perceived things um, are true for other things. So for instance, more women than men reported that they had observed someone taking credit for a woman's idea. Um, and they all, the same thing was true for having seen a woman being ignored in a conversation or patronized. Um, and about one third of women reported that someone had implied at least once that they were only an IPCC offer because they were a woman. And if they weren't a woman, then maybe they wouldn't have even been selected. Um, and so I think that like to sort of sum these perceptions up, there's two common trends. One is that both men and women felt that women were disadvantaged in the process. Um, but two, when you compare the responses between men and women, we see fewer men perceiving these challenges compared to um, women. And so um, I think it's a good question to ask is how can we um, advance women's participation or meaningful participation in the AR7 process in this next assessment cycle? Um, so the IPCC um, is, is taking this seriously. Um, and some of the, the recommendations from IPCC authors include things like, you know, making sure that we have more um, authors who are women who are being nominated into the process. So being selected by countries or observer groups, and being nominated to IPCC, but also IPCC also selecting more, more women. Um, uh, also recommendations on providing more training. Um, so training for people who are facilitating group discussions and making sure that women have had a chance to speak, um, providing training um, for, for all authors in terms of how to make a more inclusive and respectful environment. There have been recommendations made about considering family issues um, because women tend to have more family responsibilities at home than men, um, as well as uh, uh, making recommendations to consider health and travel risks when trying to decide where the location of the lead author meetings will be because women often experience greater health risks and travel risks compared to men. And then finally, also including formal monitoring um, processes and managing processes on, on what to do if, um, you know, cases of harassment um, emerge or cases of, of women um, not being, being respected, having formal processes and procedures on how to, to manage that. Um, and like I said, the IPCC is taking that seriously, I think. Um, the one thing that they did is, is struck a gender task group um, which I was a part of. And in 2019, um, we worked on a report and made six different recommendations. Um, and so uh, here, here they are on the screen and, and there's a lot of detail here, but I think that the key um, take homes is number one, there needs, we need to monitor the nominations and make sure that if there aren't enough women being um, nominated, that countries are encouraged or supported or, um, 
you know, somehow uh, recruit more, more women to nominate to the, as authors. The second is to create some sort of implementation plan to make sure that these recommendations just don't sit on a shelf somewhere, that they actually move into action. The third is to somehow make sure that there are more women in IPCC leadership roles. So that includes things like the chairs and vice chairs to actually, you know, encourage women to take those leadership roles. The fourth is to provide training. Number five was about um, checking in with authors regularly through surveys or, or feedback to see how things are going um, so that, you know, you can intervene early if, if necessary. And then the sixth and final um, suggestion was that family issues and, and pregnancy and, and things like that are, are taken into consideration. And so in 2020, the IPCC did create a gender policy and implementation plan. And there's three main areas of, of focus there. Um, one is to create equal opportunities for participation and leadership. The second major focus was creating a gender inclusive environment. And the third was raising awareness through training and guidance. And if you look at the details um, of this, um, you know, I think that a lot of the recommendations that were made from the, the report were taken up into this plan. Um, and the one way that they're trying to action it is through what they're calling the gender action team, which is basically a team of people who are accountable for taking these different um, recommendations into consideration. Um, but one interesting thing to note um, is that in the implementation plan in the approved um, IPCC plenary notes um, is that this is dependent on funding that's that's available. So these these actions aren't um, they don't have guaranteed funding with them and they do depend on um, what funding um, is available. Um, so I also wanted to just comment on a couple of my my own experiences. Um, in, in this process, um, I'm a woman or identify as a woman. I'm uh, from the global north. I'm, I'm a mid-career scientist. Um, during the IPCC process, um, I had two, two babies. So I was pregnant twice um, and I attended meetings um, pregnant twice. I had maternity leaves twice during, during the process. And so a lot of these um, experiences that were found in a survey that was done by um, Dr. Lerman and her colleagues um, really resonated for, for me as well. At the same time, it's not just about being a woman. It's about all these different identities that, that we carry and where those intersect that create our experiences. Um, so for example, I am from the, the, the global north and I have um, fairly reliable access to internet and to um, scholarly literature subscriptions. Um, I, I don't encounter paywalls that um, some other people might encounter. Um, so there are parts of the, the process um, that reduce barriers for me, but I would say as, as a woman and as a, a mid-career woman um, who had uh, who was growing a family at the, the time of the IPCC process, I did experience some, some of those, those challenges um, along the way. Um, in my own experience, I will say that I feel like things are getting better in working group two. Um, in working group two, uh, we had a training session where all authors had to participate um, and to reflect on intersectionality and, and the different challenges um, the different positionalities um, when, when they intersect what that means for authors and how we can be more inclusive. And I think that that training workshop went over really well. Um, in working group um, two, similar to the other working groups, there was a, a really strong woman as, as a co-chair, which I think really, really helps move things forward. There are some really strong uh, women in, in leadership in their roles as vice chairs in the IPCC. So I think that things are, are moving in a good direction. Um, but, you know, I think that there's still things we can do um, to, to improve for sure. Um, and that, those are, that's the end of, of my, my presentation and some of my reflections on um, being a female author in the IPCC process and working group too. Thanks. Muchísimas gracias, Sherry Lee. Muy interesante. Thank you, Sherry Lee. Your experience is very interesting. You know, with two children and such a long process, it's a four year process. And you know, all this work we've done with, with and if you add to this pandemic, it, it's even worse, you know? Uh, it was an additional burden to many of us women who are mothers or who simply, you know, carry the burden of caring for others. And, you know, stress levels, anxiety, depression is, it was higher among women during the pandemic because of the, the we were overburdened. So I think that 
support was very important at that time. But I, I was thinking about the training you mentioned, you know, and also training uh, women leaders. So they're, they're there in uh, leading positions to help us and to guide us. Thank you so much, Sherry Lee. We'll come back to you later on. After we introduce our next panelist, uh, Dr. Paola Andrea Arias Gomez. Paola is a full professor at the Environmental School of the School of Engineering of the University of Antioquia, Colombia. She completed her undergraduate studies in civil engineering and a master's degree in hydraulic resources at the National University of Colombia, Medellin. She earned a master's degree in earth and atmospheric sciences from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a PhD in geological sciences from the University of Texas, Austin, USA. She developed a postdoc research at the Geophysics Department of the University of Chile. She was the head of the Environmental School of the School of Engineering, University of Antioquia, uh, during 2017-2019. Currently, she's a member of the first working group of the, of the IPCC um, uh, AR6. She's also part of uh, a hydrogeomorphology regional working group. And also she's part of a Amazon uh, group. And she also works with the WCRP Lighthouse Activity Scientific Plan Development Team. And the project is called My Climate Risk. Paola, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mercy. And thank you, Sherry Lee, for your presentation. And actually, I would like to start talking about how the IPCC uh, is uh, distributed according to binary gender, at least, you know, men, women. Uh, um, the first image that Sherry Lee was saying, you know, this study conducted by Liverman et al., where they analyze how gender representation has changed within the IPCC working groups. As she was clearly saying, there has been an increase in the um, uh, women that participate, but it's still very low. It's about a third of women in these cases. And how I look at how this is uh, distributed according to work, work group. This has to do with disciplines as well. Uh, work group one focuses on phys physics. So this um, here we have naturally exact and physical sciences with a lower participation of women. Uh, what group two focuses on impact and vulnerability adaptation. So he, this group focuses on natural sciences, of course, but also many social sciences, humanities, and political sciences. Group three focuses on mitigation. And it also focuses a lot more on uh, um, economics, political science, engineering. So here there's also, you know, different areas. So uh, just to give you some background of this AR6, at least from the perspective of the work groups. Here you can see the distribution of those work groups regarding uh, global north and global south representation, because this goes beyond uh, gender. And this is one of the inter intersectionalities we're interested in, of course, but also regional diversity is important. And this has to do with gender diversity as well. For instance, working group one, this picture was taken in Vancouver. I think it was the uh, second or third in-person meeting we had. So it was around 234 people from 64 countries, 41% global south, 59% global north. We must remember that China is also included in the global south. So when uh, if we remove China, China, then the percentage is lower. Have a look at this representation. Uh, and th this was working group one, the one I participated uh, in. This is a Latin American and Caribbean representation in working group one in this sixth report. In yellow, we have the editors or reviewers. 
Uh, here we have uh, highly acknowledged people such as Inés Camilone, Calumina Vera, or Jose Marenco. Also, Marisa Roja, the current Environment Minister of Chile, and Ana Sorensen from Argentina. They coordinated the ch chapter. In blue, we can, you can see the lead authors of the different chapters. It was 22 people from Latin America and the Caribbean, 22 people out of 234 that participated in total. So Latin America and the Caribbean is, you know, uh, much bigger than this representation. Argentina and Brazil, Brazil account for almost half the participants. But have a look at the Caribbean, only Cuba and Jamaica. So no one from Central America and one Mexican, but there was no one properly from Central America in working group one. And uh, we have a low representation for South America, no Bolivia, Peru, Paraguay, no Guyanas, no Suriname. So uh, we still have an issue regarding regional representation. And I'd like to talk about that now. Second working group, the one Sherry Lee participated in. I don't have, you know, uh, detailed figures for Latin America and the Caribbean, but I have global information. This group included 270 experts from 67 countries. And according to the statistics, 57% were from the global south, 43% from the global north. Working group three, the one Mercy participates in and which focuses on mitigation. 278 people from 65 countries and 41% were from the global south, 59% from the global north. Well, I'm, I'm providing this context so that we can see what representation looks like according to uh, regions for this AR6 in the IPCC working groups. So we need to think about what, uh, how, what this process depends on in order to create these reports. As Mercy said, this year the reports has the reports have been uh, published. You know, in March we will be um, approving the summer report, and this brings together the three special reports um published between 2018 and 2019 so there's something essential here and it's the literature the IPCC and these working groups as Sherry Lee has told us and as Mary Lee knows as well they don't uh do uh, conduct new studies or new or make new or ask new questions they use the published literature they uh, analyze the evidence you know the uh, the also the strength of the results in order to present an analysis within the IPCC report. So we have essential input for the IPCC, and this input is the available literature. So I uh, have a look at the web at the IPCC website for the AR6. The basic information taken by the IPCC is scientific publications that have to do with peer review. Uh, publications published in peer-reviewed um, journals as well. But depending on each working group, we they also need to rely on technical and social and economic information provided by governments. For instance, when we talk about uh, sources, uh, documents come from governments, national communications as issued by different countries, technical documentation. And this is known as great literature, you know, because it's not peer-reviewed literature uh, in a process described by Mercy, with, you know, scientific review and publication in indexed journals. They actually undergo a different process, but, but they're, they're an essential input. Also, we need to consider from which discipline we address this information. There's also, which is very important as well, at the IPCC, when we review the literature, they say that that literature should have at least uh, an abstract in English. So the document may be written in another language. However, it needs to have an uh, an abstract in English. And, and that's another obstacle because um, actually, when you go to the literature, you know, the references at the end of the chapter, especially in working group one, um, are in, in English, 
So that's the first barrier, you know, the language, because uh, natural, physical, and, uh, and, nat uh, and exact sciences, uh, mostly they have literature in English, but also in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Mandarin, and other languages. And that might be an obstacle as well, so that that science developed in different countries can actually be included within the IPCC. Therefore, there is an essential uh, element uh, uh, because of this literature. And these uh, publications are some of the end products of the entire scientific process. Therefore, we need to talk about these barriers when, you know, um, doing science. And, and Mercy mentioned some of these obstacles at the beginning. And I would like to say that we need to remember this in particular. Uh, one of the problems is the lack of diversity in climate science research, not just, you know, climate change science that include um, every area of knowledge, because climate change has theoretical developments and also scientific issues that include every uh, knowledge or area. It's not just physics, you know? So, for instance, Carbon Brief wrote a report last year. They used different statistics to analyze the lack of diversity. And th this is also a gender issue. Have a look at this analysis. This is the top 100 climate papers when it comes to a working group one topics. So where do authors come from, you know, of the top 100 climate papers? Have a look at this. Most of these papers come from the global north. Uh, first of all, Europe, then North America, also, you know, Oceania uh, with Australia, and Asia as well, probably mostly China, and then South America, and then Africa. They have the lowest um, figures when it comes to these uh, papers. Have a look at the uh, location of these people and the different authors. We see here then 29% of the authors uh, of those top 100 papers come from the United States. And have a look at these people from Australia, also quite a high number. And Brazil within the uh, global south is one of the countries that has the highest percentages. But you can see how the global south uh, does, is not really represented in the top 100 uh, papers. And we need to challenge that. What makes a publication uh, a top 100 paper or not? Let's have a look at gender, you know, binary again, men, women, okay? It's still not enough because there's so much more than that, but still. When we talk about men and women and we analyze these, contributions, um, we see, uh, and we go back to the top 100 climates, there is a higher participation of women in the global north. But still, re regardless of the location, we can see that most uh, papers are led by men and not with women, even in the global north. And have a look at the global south, the same happens in South America and Africa. So it's many things that actually have to do with these uh, barriers when it comes to doing science, as Mercy was saying, you know, but also funds, okay? Having the necessary funds to, you know, uh, do science and for the Global South countries to work in this regard. And also we need to uh, work with the Global North because it's not just about doing science. In a way, if the science is not published, it's, it, it, it is invisible. And that's also part of the system, and we should challenge this. If the studies, you know, you know do not reach main journals, uh, then that science becomes invisible, uh, especially regarding the IPCC process. This is an HR article that talks about uh, uh, African researchers that lead a campaign for equity in global collaborations. 
these collaborations uh, between Global North and Global South institutions many times are not equal because many times from the Global North, uh, maybe there is someone, uh, I don't know, a person from the Global South joins the project, but there is no, no capacity building in the area so that the South can work independently from the North. Uh, another example, a study conducted uh, through uh, interviews and surveys among uh, paper reviewers. For instance, when someone from an article is very famous, that paper tends to receive better comments than when the paper that might have the same quality has no famous authors. And this also um, makes the global south disadvantaged, but also the north, when the authors are young or are not part of prestigious institutions. So we need to remember that the scientific uh, system, which is a productive system based on capitalism, ends up perpetuating these differences. And this is also uh, reflected in the IPCC reports, because what we do is review the published scientific literature and also how many papers are cited in one region, in another region, and are they written by uh, women uh, PIs or not. This article in Nature shows that women are credited less in science than men. So this ends up being reflected in, uh, in the IPCC report, and this, uh, this is connected to my IPCC experience as well. Have a look at this summary for policymakers um, in the in working group one. The idea here was to collect everything that had been analyzed in working group one. We needed to know in which regions we know that uh, precipitation extreme events are changing. Have a look at this. The green uh, hexagons show us that we have available reviewed scientific literature that shows us that these events are increasing. But have a look at the gray hexagons. It means that there is limited literature. So there, is, there are not enough published uh, um, um, articles as needed by the IPCC, but it doesn't mean that in that region nothing's happening. No, it means that there is no published peer-reviewed scientific literature written in the English so that we can include it in the in the IPCC. So in gray, we have basically the global south, and that is one of the, the issues because the scientific structure uh, keeps permeating uh, the IPCC. And finally, science, and in particular, uh, physical, uh, exact, and natural sciences still uh, are still based on patriarchy, and there is also colonialism. Sherry Lee was saying that. She said that she talked about a list, like a hot list, as prepared by Reuters last year of the 1,000 uh, most important researchers in the area of climate change. Of the 1,000 scientists, uh, I would like to talk about that uh, hot index. It was defined according to the number of citations of publications, also influence on social media and political influence as well. Of the 1,000 people, only 122 were women and only two were ranked in the top 100. So this is a spe specifically a gender issue. Also regarding the region, 111 scientists were from the global south. And if we re exclude China, it, we only had 23 from the south global, from, from the global south. So it's, it's impossible to be ranked, you know, regarding the relevance of a scientist, because these are based on these uh, patriarchal concepts and colonialist concepts as well. There's another issue, there are different knowledge levels according to that patriarchy. Many of the people that are included in the list of science, natural and exact sciences, um, exclude other people that come from uh, social sciences and they are essential for climate change. 
because this is a climate change index, uh, you know, in general. So it, it should include everyone, but, but these people are not represented here. So there is also an underrepresentation regarding the areas of knowledge. Finally, this is, so I'm not sure if this still applies. This applied for the for, for AR5. Have a look at the connection of the authors of Working Group 3. Have a look at most of the authors. They had uh, connections with the USA and the UK because they studied there, because they they collaborate with institutions institutions from the countries because they work in those regions. So this this showed us at the time that dependency on the uh, global on the global north. This is also very interesting, uh, especially when we study climate change mitigation. This paper analyzes how many how some mitigation scenarios considered within the IPCC scenarios are still based on colonialism. For instance, uh, GAG redu uh, reductions, yes, of course, but still an inhabitant from the north uh, emits more than a south uh, inhabitant. So inequality gaps are not even mentioned. And that's something essential to discuss because that's also a way to think science, you know, and science needs to be needs to contribute to reducing these inequality gaps. Well, this is what I wanted to share with you regarding um, the science. I am an engineer and I am trying to provide this background because it's important for the IPCC report. Thank you, Paola, for your very interesting presentation. I think you are being, you know, very clear about very difficult topics. And we need to think about how a region, the, the global south, and also the participation of women can uh, be higher, especially in the science and policy IPCC uh, report. We have time for two questions. Question number one, addressed to Sherry Lee. Sherry Lee. They're asking me regarding these statistics, you know, um, on the participation of the authors. Is there more information by country or can we find more uh, detailed information about who participated from our region so that we know what's going on? Thank you. Um, so in the published study, that information um, isn't really provided. Um, if you look at the report that the gender um, task group submitted to the IPCC, um, some of those details are there, but in, not a lot of not not in a lot of detail. So I'll I'll read out um, that the, how they summarize the. Uh, regional differences in responses. They said that for several questions, the strongest differences in responses between men and women occurred in Latin America and Caribbean region. Women were three to, to uh, sorry, women were three, um, three to or more than men um, uh, of that region gave a negative response, right? So uh, more women uh, gave a re negative response than men regarding gender balance in that IHPCC. Women were also up to nine times more likely to give a negative response than their male colleagues from that region on their um, general overall experiences with the IPCC. One of the most negative experiences um, was regarding the way people felt about shaping the overall report, which was particularly negative for respondents from North America, Oceania, Europe, and Latin America and Caribbean. Respondents from Europe, North America, and Oceania reported higher negative response rates with regard to gender bias and, and discrimination experiences, um, while respondents from Asia reported lower negative response rates. Um, and that's the, the only detail that was given on the, the regional differences. It's an important topic, and we need, we need to consider the participation of women scientists as well in this process. There's a further question uh, that I would like to address at the end. But Paola, I would like to ask you about the processes in your country regarding researcher allocation. Um, maybe if one of our researchers wants to participate, 
what should they do? What is the case, what happens in Colombia specifically? And how can we, we know, create groups of authors to, to work with the IPCC? Paola, what can you tell us about uh, Colombia's experience? How are local experts can participate in the IPCC processes? Thank you for the question. It's a very interesting question. And it's one of the critical issues when it comes to regional and gender representation. Uh, well, I'm going to say how it should work because it's not the case in many countries. Um, it should go like this. Each country has a focal point, an IPCC focal point. And it's usually the Ministry of the Environment. For instance, in Colombia, this is um, delegated to the Meteorological Institute. So those institutes should, you know, make an open call when the IPCC makes a call to, uh, you know, um, nominate authors. So that should be, then the institution should, you know, receive your, your some very um, clear, you know, live information and like a live sheet. And that meteorological center then should send the official information to the IPCC because it's not you you don't apply it directly to the IPCC you need to go through the governmental channels that's one way to do it another way to do to do it is that IPCC members from the bureau or the secretariat can help you apply you know with the same conditions uh you can reach the IPCC from the focal point or through someone from the secretariat it, it, it's the same competition, let's say, you know, you uh, enter the same pool of candidates. And here is the issue. Many times that call is not even made. I know countries where they have the call, you know, they share the call with the universities, research centers, and they um, communicate the call. But in other countries, that doesn't happen. In some countries, we don't even know that there is a, a call, you know. Um, for instance, I, I worked and I tried to find a way to, you know, um, participate, participate because some friends of mine told me they had participated in the IPCC report. And actually, I was nominated by someone from the IPCC Bureau. But it's not because I knew at the time that there was a process, you know. So um, as authors who've already had the, the opportunity to participate, we should be uh, pay uh, close attention, you know, when the next call comes up, we need to disseminate it, we need to talk to the focal point so that they're really doing their job, because that's one of the main barriers. Focal points, especially in the focal in the global south, don't pay attention or are not fair when they nominate people. And as the IPCC is politically neutral, you know, the IPCC cannot say, oh, come on, Ecuador, there's uh, no one uh, from from your country. They, they can't do that. So that's a barrier. That's a major barrier. And it has to do with the work we need to do with the government. We need to show people that it's this is very important within the process because it's going to strengthen the representation of what's happening in our countries regarding climate adaptation and mitigation uh, because many countries do not even know that this is important yes definitely i totally agree well, uh, to close the meeting i would like to say that we should also work you know beyond the ipcc when there are regional, sub-regional associations. We need to start working on climate issues at the, I don't know, Andean region, coastal regions, or other regions, so that we can analyze material, publish material. You know, it's four years. And within the four years, uh, you can uh, review literature up to some point. So researchers really need to work uh, within a network. And we need to uh, try and publish material that can then be used for the IPCC report. Be because as I was saying, it's important to publish in indexed journals. Well, the debate has been very interesting. 
Uh, Maria Inez, maybe uh, is not very happy that we have to finish, but we need to. Uh, but uh, Maria Inez, I'll give you the floor so that you can, you know, close the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to participate as your moderator. Thank you, Mercy. Thank you, Paola, Sherry Lee. Uh, it has been a very interesting debate and a lot of food for thought. So we'll keep organizing other webinars because these topics are very interesting. Uh, and we need to rethink them. And from the at the IAI, we enjoy promoting this uh, this type of debate, you know. And that's our aim to think about TD science and to think about including different scientists within the IPCC report, especially from the global south. Uh, thank you much for your thank you very much for your participation. Uh, uh, so from the on behalf of the IAI and plus climate, thank you for participating. Hopefully you if you've missed the, the, the event, you'll be able to watch the recording later on. And we'll see you in our next event. Thank you very much. Bye bye.